I wanted to talk about um, something that you may have seen before, but just help you understand a, a concept. Um, and that concept is ghost voltage. So who's ever heard of ghost voltage before? Anybody? No? Okay. So when you hear ghost voltage, what do you think? Power. Can you just be quiet for a second? Okay. Okay. Ghost voltage, what do you think of? Is it like remnants of voltage that's being, that's kind of like left in? Sorry. Remnants of voltage. Remnants of voltage left off of, um, coming from wires. Remnants of voltage coming from wires, sure. Okay, that sounds about right, yeah. <laughs> voltage that just isn't ready. <laughs> yeah, is it? Okay, yeah, it makes it makes it makes a ghostly noise. You know, so ghost voltage, um, the way I would define it is it's it's a case where you are picking up a voltage, you're measuring a voltage, but that voltage doesn't actually do any work. Like you can't get it to do anything. And so an example would be you're measuring 24 volts somewhere, but as soon as you go to energize the circuit, then that voltage disappears. And so to kind of to start with, the easiest way to think about this would be, um, imagine that you have a, uh, a, a you know, water pressure on your house and you don't have any toilets running, you don't have any hoses running, you don't have anything like that, and you put a pressure gauge on one of your uh, hose bibs and you measure the water pressure on your house. That's what we call static pressure. It's a version of static pressure. It means that there's no dynamic flow. Nothing is actually moving and you'll measure a pressure. But the minute that you start to actually move the water, the minute that you you know run a tub or you run a shower or whatever, now that pressure drops. I mean, you all have experienced this where you've got two bathrooms in a house, two people are taking a shower, the water pressure drops, right? It's kind of the same concept here, but, but imagine that you're measuring a pressure, you're measuring a voltage, but the second that you go to use that voltage, it just disappears on you completely, right? It just, or, or, or not necessarily completely, but it doesn't, it, it's not capable of doing any work. So that's what we call ghost voltage, is when you're measuring something, but then when you go to use it, it, it's not there anymore. And this starts by just understanding how your meter works. So your meter is actually a load. Your meter is actually taking voltage in one side, or taking current in one side and actually creating a path through the circuit. So you're actually wiring your meter in as if you were wiring in a light bulb when you're measuring voltage, right? But your meter is a very high impedance load. And impedance is just another fancy way of saying resistance. It's all, all the different types of resistance. It's a very high resistance load. And so across your meter, you will see voltages that, um, that only are there because of that very high resistance. As soon as a lower resistance load comes into place, and now you actually have current flow, now, now it disappears. And rather than talking about it in super fancy terms, let's, let's, let's look at it from, uh, uh, from a more basic standpoint. There's a couple different things that can go on here. If you've got a wire and it is being energized. So let's imagine, um, you've maybe never thought about this before, but if you have a, uh, a transformer, so a transformer symbol, I always like to kind of draw the symbols for things, is this, let's see here. Yep. That, that's not the correct number of wraps, but, and that's a really bad transformer. But when you energize the primary on a transformer, so we're gonna say we energize it with 240 volts, but this circuit is open. So we're gonna say, we're just gonna draw a switch here, and it's open, and then we have a load, maybe it's a contactor coil, whatever, and this is 24 volts here, right? When we energize the primary on this transformer, does the transformer draw any current when the secondary is open? Any current? No. Well, how is that possible? Because we have 240 volts applied across this coil here. How is that possible? How is it possible that it doesn't draw any current? The voltage isn't moving. Oh, it is moving. Oh, it, you better believe it's moving. It's alternating current. So it's moving back and forth 60 times per second, 60 hertz, right? This is connected to 240 volts through a coil. If you, if you ever listen to a transformer, even when nothing's running, what's it sound like? <laughs> That's the ghost in the transformer. Yeah, it makes it, it'll make a little hum, right? You'll hear it humming. If you feel it, you can feel a little bit of heat there, right? And that's true even if you don't have uh, any load on the secondary, even if there isn't any current moving through the secondary, right? 
This is called excitation current. That's the fancy name for it. I had to look it up because I didn't remember exactly what it was. I wrote it down on this piece of paper so that way I could remember it. Um, and it is kind of a cool word. I mean, let's be honest, excitation current. But it's very small. And that's because you have this back electromotive force. You have this uh, inductive reactance that, uh, that occurs in the secondary. Um, where basically it's just, it, you know, it's moving one direction, but then it's just going straight back to the source again. Um, so there isn't a lot of current moving on, but there is this initial excitation current. So if I took, and there's a, there's a video on this, uh, we'll link to it in this video uh, by Veritasium, where they talk about like this theoretical circuit that's basically the width of the entire universe, and there's all this interesting stuff. But a lot of the ways that we imagine that electricity works is wrong. Okay, so we imagine that electricity is like, you know, just trains moving down a track. You know, you've got these electrons and they're just moving one direction. Or some people will say it's like a, a tube full of ping pong balls, right? And you push one ping pong ball on one end and another one falls out the other side. But really what electrons are is all of these infinitesimally tiny uh, particles slash energy units um, that when we are moving electrons through a conductor, they're happening really erratically. And it's just on average we're creating this motion. But what's creating the motion is something called a sine wave, which are just these, just these waves that exist, these circular waves that come off of a wire. And so within a transformer, that's how we can convert from 240 to 24 because we have this, uh, this electromagnetic field that we're intensifying by all of these wraps. So these sine waves are an electromagnetic field, okay? And I know this is getting kind of weird here, but I'm going to explain why we're talking about this. So let's say that we have a wire that's running through a conductor or running through a unit, and it has 240 volts applied across it. And then I have another wire, and, and, this, is, and this wire is connecting to something. So it's, you know, it's connecting over here, and it's going to a compressor winding or whatever, and that compressor's running. And so there's this, there's this field, but now I run another wire next to this wire, and it cuts through these, this electromagnetic field. That wire is going to actually pick up a little bit of voltage. There's going to be, there's going to be a slight potential difference that's picked up in that wire. <coughs> and so it's going to cut through these, these lines, and we're going to get a little bit. Have you ever taken a meter, and you're measuring, and you just measure these like weird small voltages, you know, one volt here, two volt here, whatever? Often that's what this is. Okay? And so this is called induction. So it's what happens when, and same thing that happens in a transformer, when we go from the primary and we induce a current in the secondary, we can do the same thing by running two wires next to each other. This is why you don't take low voltage wires and run them right next to high voltage wires. This is why, especially with more complicated control systems, you have to be really careful about that and you have to be careful about grounding and all that stuff because you'll get these induced voltages that mess with the controls. It's why, like on some of these high-end communicating systems, after lightning strikes, you'll get these weird faults and that kind of thing. I get this in my house all the time. It's one of the reasons. It's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons why that happens. Because when you have a lightning strike, there's a lot of magnetic, electromagnetic sign going on. It's traveling through the whole house, and that's picked up in those conductors, and it gives the controls weird signals. You guys follow that? Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so the idea that Electrons move through wires just because you're kind of bumping one electron into another is not really true. We use those kind of theories. We talk about it like flowing like water. But really, it's more like there's these electromagnetic shepherds that move along the outside of a wire at the speed of light. It's, these, it's this force that exists on the outside of the wire that moves electrons through the wire. It's that external electromagnetic force that moves electrons on average from one side to the other side. Does that make sense? And the reason why that matters is because that's how a transformer works. If that wasn't the case, a transformer wouldn't work. We wouldn't be able to transmit uh, a potential difference through open space because that is what we're doing. Now we have these, you know, we have these plates of metal and all this, but at the end of the day, our primary and our secondary and a transformer are not touching one another. They're not physically in contact. There's a lacquer that insulates them from each other. And the same thing is also true in a capacitor, right? The two sides of a capacitor do not touch each other. There's this, you know, basically plastic sheeting with a metal coating on it, and one side doesn't touch the other side. But yet, there is a motion of current in and out, a potential difference across that capacitor, and it's because of the same force. 
that electromagnetic field that exists. That's why that can work. But that's only one reason why we see ghost voltage. So again, the point being that one of the reasons we see ghost voltage is when we run conductors next to each other. If you've ever taken like uh, a microphone cable for uh, you know doing video or you've taken a video camera or your, or your phone and you're videoing and all of a sudden you'll get like this weird buzz and you'll notice that it, you're near something that's high voltage. I do. I have this a lot with my podcasting. I'll have a one of my microphone cables will run next to a power cord for my computer, and all of a sudden you'll get this you'll get this weird buzz. And that's because I mean you won't get a buzz. The buzz will occur in the. It's a whole different thing. And that's because you're running your microphone cable next to that high voltage power line, and it's picking up that 60 hertz, that um, 60 cycle. Uh, noise, that, that hum. One lesson is we don't want to run conductors next to each other, uh, especially high voltage and low voltage conductors, especially control conductors. We don't want to run them in the same, you know, through the same hole in the cabinet. We don't, when we're running them inside of a, inside of an assembly, we don't want to lay them next to each other. We don't want to take wires and wrap them back and forth with just, with just a bunch of extra and jam it right next to high voltage because you're going to get that induction. So one of the sources of ghost voltage is induction. When you use, some of you may have meters that do this, but they do make voltmeters that have what they call a low Z mode. Has anyone ever see that, seen that? It'll say low Z. And that's a mode of measuring voltage where rather than using a very high resistance load within the meter, it uses a much lower resistance. Z means impedance, which is just, again, another way of saying resistance. A very low Z low impedance path through the meter, and that causes these ghost voltages to disappear. Because when you have this lower resistance load in the meter, now you, it, it, those don't show up because they're not gonna actually be able to power that load in the meter. Um, but when we're using our typical voltage meters, this is one reason that we see it. But there's another reason why we see ghost voltage, and it's actually a more common reason. And you'll see this sometimes where you'll be like, you'll be measuring outside with your voltmeter, We'll, we'll draw a really basic, a really basic circuit here. So we're going to call this our Y circuit. All of a sudden, I forgot to how to draw a Y. This is our Y circuit. I know it gets weird sometimes. It's early. All right, and then it goes back over to common. We'll draw a switch in here. This is our thermostat. Call for cool, right? When there's a when there's a, th a thermostatic call for cool, the temperature increases, causes the switch to close, which then energizes our contactor coil, right? and our contactor coil is connected in between Y and C. Now, if I take my meter, my voltmeter, and I measure from here to here, I would expect that I'm gonna measure 24 volts, right? And if this switch is open, of course, well, in this case, and if this switch is open, I'm not gonna measure anything. But if I close the switch and I measure 24 volts across that, but then as soon as I close that, or sorry, when it's open, I measure 24 volts. So let's say, let's, let's say I take this wire off of here and I measure, Yeah, but that's... For your illustration. You have 24 there, but when it closes, it drops out. This is actually Y here, and this is R. That's the problem with my illustration here. I'm measuring 24 volts here. Um, I energize the circuit, and then all of a sudden, it goes to zero volts. It disappears on me. My voltage disappears when I go to actually use it. And this happens because I have some sort of additional resistance in the circuit. So it could be that past the contactor, I've got a poor connection. There could be a wire nut here. And it could be connected, but that connection could have something like you know, 200 ohms in it of resistance. And I'm not going to bother doing the math here because you're never going to do the math. I, I have a whole article that covers ghost voltage if you want to go through all the math and how all that all works. But in cases where you have really high resistance, it's just like having the water system in your house with a big kink or a big clog in the main water line. When you're not using it, when it's static, you're gonna measure that full pressure. If there's no faucets running, there's no, you, you hook up pressure, you got the full pressure because it's able to make it through and back up and you see that pressure. But the second that it becomes dynamic and you start to use it, the second that we close this switch and now we energize the contactor, now it disappears on me. And again, there is still going to be flow, there is still going to be motion, but that voltage drop is significant because the voltage drop exists across uh, another point. And it could be before or after the coil. It doesn't have to be one or the other because it's all a single path. And so you're creating another series load. And so the voltage drop exists across the point of highest resistance. And normally the highest point of resistance in an electrical circuit would be the load, the designed load. 
But if you have a really bad connection or you have a thermostat that's got something wrong with it where it's not creating a proper path within the thermostat, right? That's going to become a higher resistance load and now you're gonna have significant voltage drop and you're not gonna see that full current across, uh, across your load the way that it's supposed to be when it's energized. So again, the point being that the difference between static and dynamic, static meaning what you measure when it's not doing anything, dynamic is what you measure when it's actually energized and you're intending to use it. And what you would do in this case, when you see that weird ghost voltage that disappears on you, figure out where the actual issue is in the circuit. There's gonna be some sort of poor connection uh, and what you can do, and this is, this is something that a lot of us have learned, you can actually take something like, cause it's not always gonna be the contactor coil, this is just a single example. You can actually use something like a contactor coil or a relay coil, basically in place of a meter. That can become a low Z meter. Imagine if you take the coil on a relay, a 9340 or a contactor, you connect two wires to it, and you use that to test the system, pulls in, you have 24 volts, doesn't pull in, you don't have 24 volts. That's basically a low Z uh, voltmeter because your voltmeter in these cases just becomes ineffective when it's not energized, if that makes sense. It's kind of a confusing, kind of a confusing topic, but both of these things are cases where you see voltage and it's not able to do work. And just knowing that that exists is gonna make you kind of second guess yourself sometimes before you make that call to Sam or Bert and say, I'm measuring voltage, but it's not doing anything. Just recognize, just because you're measuring voltage when a circuit is not fully energized, when it's not doing any work, that doesn't mean that there's not still a problem. So in many cases, what we do is we'll take a, you know, we'll take a thermostat wire off outside and we'll start measuring the wire and we'll see, oh, well, you know, it should be working because I have voltage here, right? where, where it's supposed to be. But once you start to use it, then it doesn't, doesn't do anything. It doesn't do any work. Wires running next to each other, that's induction situations where you have undesigned high loads, bad connections, whatever, that's uh, caused by voltage drop. And both of those cause goes voltage. One being because you're creating a small voltage, the other being because your voltage is too small because of too much resistance. Any questions? Not my best work here, but that's okay. You no, know, it's great. It's, those are really hard problems to find. So practically, when you're looking for them, you don't automatically know often that the power is dropping <coughs> out as soon as you get the call. Right. Once you know that part, you pretty much solved it. But what happens at first is it just looks like you're going around testing things, but when you try to run it, it's not working. Right. And it, it takes a while to realize that I have voltage right up till the second that a certain thing calls, and then that drops voltage. Correct. Correct. And another thing, and that's the reason why, if you've ever seen a therm a thermostats where when there's a short, this is actually another reason that I didn't cover, but it, it, you don't see it in this way in the same way that we're discussing here. If you've ever had a thermostat where you got to shorten the system and it will go through time delay and as soon as it goes through time delay, it just goes back in time delay again and it just stays in time delay forever. Have you ever, anybody ever seen that happen before? Well, the reason why that's happening, or you know, at least theoretically, my, my theoretical reason why it's happening is that when that en it energizes that load and that load now has a very low resistance, there's a big voltage drop in that case as well because through the switch gear of the thermostat, it's designed to handle a certain amount of current. When you get this big inrush of additional current, there's also a voltage drop. And so it basically just throws it, because the voltage drops so much, it just throws it back in a time delay again and starts all over. It's not a design, I used to think it was a design feature, like it was supposed to do that, but it's not. It's just, it's just because it's losing power because of this huge inrush of current that's, that's occurring. So if you ever see a thermostat doing that, where it won't come out of time delay, it's because there's a short. And so disconnect the thermostat and go through that kind of isolation testing to figure out which conductor or, or load is shorted. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to hvacrschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.